We're getting ready to get started tonight. Uh, quick, quick couple questions for some of you. See if you were paying attention last week. Um, what are the two types of revelation that God... General and special. Very close. General and special revelation. You're right. Very good. I like it. That was good. She, she, she got it. That was good. Close enough, right? Um, what are the three... You can't answer this. What are the three questions I told you that you should learn from the book Tactics that are very important to remember? What are they? What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? Have you considered this? Very good. What? I said I would bring you a prize. I definitely will bring it next week, okay? That's good. Memorize them. If you don't, if you don't know them, those are three questions, and I can't reteach. You can, you can go online, and you can watch the teaching last week, and you'll understand how they fit in. But important ones to learn. And buy the book Tactics. It's a great book. But uh, they, they really help. If you remember, we talked last week about the different types of apologetics. Uh, and, I, and one more question, I guess, to, to know where we're going. I, I gave you a couple different ones. I, I gave, gave you uh, apologetics. Uh, well, I'm not going to go through them all again. But which one are we landing on that we're going to cover tonight? Does anyone remember? Classical. classical apologetics. Okay, and so, and even more specific on the classical approach, we're looking at um, classical approach really kind of outlined by Norman Geisler. Norman Geisler was a, a great apologist who passed away a few years ago. Um, as a matter of fact, if you, if you go through all these classes to the end, this is kind of a, a promise from me, I will get you the book, 12 Points That Show Christianity is True. You'll get a free book if you just show up to all the classes. That's pretty cool, right? If you miss one because you're sick, I'll still give you a book. But if you miss one because you went out to eat, not no book. <laughs> you can just buy your own book. But um, anyway... In those 12 steps, we're going to, that's what we're going to be covering. So a lot of what I'm going to say tonight is really comes from some of Geisler's um, lectures and from that book. Um, but, I mean, the classical approach is, is, has been around for a long time, and so it's not specifically you know, his, but he just happened to put it into 12 steps. And so we're going to cover those 12 steps. And so tonight, um, we're just going to talk, tackle two of the steps. So two steps in the classical approach. The first one that we're going to talk about, and remember, if you remember from last week, we're building a case for apologetics in the classical approach so that someone who doesn't believe in God um, and doesn't believe in truth, first of all, can, can understand that there is truth, then there's God, and you build a case till you get to Jesus, and then you get to the New Testament, and, and then it opens the door. So you're building a, a case by, um, by arguing points, 12 points, that people would come up with. Now, not everybody needs all 12 points, but if somebody comes to you with doubts or questions in regards to these, you're building a case. If somebody comes to you as a tabula rosa, a blank slate, it's a perfect opportunity just to start from the beginning and kind of build it. And remember, from last week, we never want to give them all the points. It's apologetics light, right? Because you don't want to blast people. You want to just remember maybe one or two points or at the most, right, when you're talking to family members. So the first point in the 12... The, um, the 12 step uh, points there, the 12 points to um, the classical apologetics is, is truth about reality is knowable. I want to say up front that the reason this is so important, we live in a culture where a lot of people will say they don't believe in truth. Now, they may not say that. Most people aren't going to say, hey, I don't believe in truth. But what they're going to say is, well, I believe, and then they tell you what they believe. You hear that all the time. Well, I believe that uh, God would never send anyone to hell. Oh, that's nice that you believe that. I wouldn't say that, but I'm listening. I believe that if two people love one another, it's okay to sleep together outside of marriage. I believe, you fill in the blank. I believe, my belief is that, you know, that there's whatever, you know, God, God is a woman. I don't know, whatever. People come up with the most outrageous things, but they always start that kind of with, I believe, right? And so... We, we're not interested in just what someone believes or what a good meme says on the Internet. We're not interested in just uh, who has a you know, really good persuasive art. We're interested in what's true. What, what's the truth? And, that, and so a lot of times if you're talking to somebody, that's a good place to start. You know, I, often I, as, a, as a hospital chaplain, when I get in conversations with people, I always say to them, you know, I'm a truth seeker, aren't you, you know? Most people aren't going to say, well, absolutely not. I, I, have an, I have an aversion to truth. No, they're going to say, yeah, you know, we are. And aren't we all looking for truth, you know? 
And then it opens doors to say, what do you think is true? And you can kind of ask questions. But here's the, here's the thing I want to, to start with. Because we live in this culture where people have a really an upside-down idea of even if there is something called truth. But truth about reality is knowable. And so the outline we're going to look at tonight initially, and we're going to kind of go two parts. But on this very first point is what is truth? Can truth be known? Is truth absolute? And then we're going to talk about some objections and some responses. So here's a question, and th these are really good. I'm going to start out with the syllogism. Remember I told you guys you're going to learn some syllogisms? So if you could take one of you if you, if you, have, if you have a note card, you're supposed to bring note cards, grab a note card, write the syllogism down. It's a good one to memorize. It's a simple, syllogism is just a simple way of learning. It's, 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 uh, uh, you know, it's points that logically move to a conclusion. Okay, and so here's a syllogism about truth, just kind of easy to remember. Now I will say this. This is one of the most important things I'm going to tell you uh, f um, is, well, in this series, is next week, I really want you to come ready to feverishly write down syllogisms, because I'm going to give at least probably two, maybe three separate syllogisms on, on evidence for God, or the existence of God. We're going to talk about that next week, okay? So those ones you're going to want to write down, because you want to memorize these syllogisms, because they're easy ways to remember how to share your faith with somebody. Did, Rana, did you ever make a, a slide for this? Okay, here it goes. So here it is, premise number one. Truth is that which corresponds to reality, if you're writing it down. Now, these will be in the notes that you can get at the end, but it's good to write them on these note cards. Premise one, or, or point one, truth is that which corresponds to reality. Point two, reality does not change based on belief or perception. So I'm reading them again. Truth is that which corresponds to reality, premise one. Premise two, reality does not change based on belief or perception. And then the final is conclusion. Therefore, truth is objective and unchanging regardless of personal beliefs. Now, get the reason to have a syllogism like this is so that you can understand. I'll read it one more time. But so you can kind of understand how to frame in your mind the argument for truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality, premise one. Premise two, reality does not change based on belief or perception. And then conclusion, therefore, truth is objective and unchanging regardless of personal beliefs. So Arizona Christian University in a 2020 survey, listen to this, they found that 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. Let me say that again. In a 2020 survey by Arizona Christian University, they found that only 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. Isn't that astounding to you? So this means that we live in a post-Christian culture, and I know that, and you've probably heard people say that. When we, when we state we believe in biblical truths, we have to understand that 94% of Americans believe differently than, than that. That doesn't mean that there, there aren't many people who have some beliefs you know, that are maybe have biblical references. But it means we believe, as, as Bible-believing Christians, everything in the Bible is true, and in the lens by which we view the world is the Bible. And that if, you're, if you believe that way, you're only part of 6% of the, the culture we live in. So I can tell you where we're at. And another study done by Summit Ministries in, in 2023, after surveying people from across the whole United States, 40% of Americans believe each person de determines their own version of the truth. Is that crazy to you? 40% say that they, they, they can come up with a version of the truth, right? And don't you hear this all the time? You hear it constantly. Well, I believe. Well, I believe. Well, I believe. In another, yeah, so, and so what can we take away from this? Well, first of all is the belief that there are different versions of truth to people. They think that. Um, this gives us some insight into the thoughts of the people that, that you encounter every day, whether you're at home, in your own home sometimes, your kids or people, maybe in schools, workplace, among friends, neighbors. That means that you have people who have this kind of understanding. In John chapter 18, verse 38, Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate asks the question, what is truth? Right? And this is the question everyone is really kind of asking in our culture. What is truth, you know? 
And the problem is we live in a, we're inundated by, with social media by so many different ideas, right? And so people cling to an idea and then another idea and another idea, but nobody's really finding out is this idea or this thought or this statement, is it grounded in truth? And so truth, and this is, I want you to get this, okay? This, I want you to, um, I want you to, to memorize this. It's the first point of that premise. Truth is that which corresponds with reality. That is the definition of truth. That which corresponds with reality. This is something you should memorize. And, and, and matter of fact, let's just say it back. Say, truth is that which corresponds with reality. Okay. If I say I, 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 I'm in a building teaching a class, that statement is true because I am indeed in a building teaching a class right now, right? Truth matches its object. Now, some of this for you is going to sound like this is a really elementary teaching. But I'm telling you that it's not. If, in our, if, if what I told you earlier is that 40% of Americans believe each person determines their own version of truth, then it needs to be addressed, right? So truth matches its object. This is called the correspondence theory of truth. If you say this table that's in front of me is round, the statement, in fact, is true if, in fact, it is actually round, right? Some here might say, though, that, you know, I'm not sure, you, you know, is this really important? And I'm going to tell you it's, it is. It's so important. And you'll find as you talk to people that people don't, generally don't believe in truth in our culture. Truth is telling it like it is. Now, there used to be kind of a negative thought of that. People are like, I'm going to tell it like it is, right? That's not what I'm saying, but it really is. You're telling something like it actually is, and you're, you're doing a service to somebody regarding the eternal things about purpose and meaning and value in life if you do tell them like it is because let me just tell you, a lot of people are not hearing what it actually is. They're hearing what they want to hear or they're hearing all these ideas, but we need to tell them the truth, right? So it's telling people like it is. Many people don't like it because this is what they say. You're arrogant if you say that. Or you're judgmental. Or you're closed-minded. These are all catchphrases in our culture. But you're not. Now, you can come across with an arrogant sense, but saying that, that you know truth and truth is knowable, is not arrogant. Truth about reality is knowable. That's the point we're making tonight. Truth about reality is knowable. So if we can understand truth, what is false? False is what does not tell it like it is. False is what does not correspond with reality. False is what does not match its object. So if I say I'm a woman, this statement is false, whether I believe it or not. Okay? Now this is a whole other teaching, right? But we're not going there. If I say this table is square, that statement does not correspond with the reality that it's round. So what is the truth about truth? Truth is that which corresponds with reality. All people hold this correspondence view of truth. Everyone holds it. I'm going to prove that through this conversation. They may not say that they do, but they hold it, believe me. Those who deny this theory use it in practice. Do you get that? If you deny the theory, you're using it. If you say, you know, I don't believe in truth, the follow-up question is, is that true? See, it's, it's impossible to not live by it. But we live in a culture that tries to ascribe the ability to just create truth. So if I were to say, I don't exist, I'm here, therefore I exist, right? So that's a a fallacy. What if I said, I don't speak English. I'm speaking English. Now, someone may say that in another language, and they may not fully speak our language, but they spoke enough to say that phrase, right? The person who, att who attempts to deny this view of truth sees this view in their denial. They're admitting that this view is not correct. They are acknowledging that there is a true view. That's what they're saying. 
That's why it doesn't, it doesn't work. But what you're doing, remember, if, I, if you go back to last week, you're helping people in the conversation, apologetic conversations, you're helping them to, to, to discover the errors in their thinking. You're trying, to, you're trying to reveal to them without just telling them. And sometimes it's best to do it in, in the form of a question, right? What do you mean by that? Remember that? This simply doesn't work in the real world. People can't decide truth. I always tell people, it's a simple one, but I always tell people when I'm talking about things, I say, you know, if I was to stand on a highway and just say, I don't believe in automotive, automobiles, it doesn't matter if I say that or not, I'll be flattened, right? In other words, my belief never creates reality. But people live like it. They say things like it does. Well, I believe, and then they tell you this whole thing. Like, all of a sudden, because they say they believe it, it must be something that they could give their whole life over to, which is really scary, right? If someone's boss decided to pay them in marshmallows instead of money, saying that his truth is marshmallows are the same as currency, there'd be an objection, wouldn't there? The person being paid would would, would borrow from the correspondence view of truth to argue that marshmallows are not the same as dollars. If they were told they were being paid in dollars, being paid in marshmallows it is not the same. It's not the truth. So, so what I'm saying is there would be an immediate pushback to that whole idea. We're going to look at some arguments for the truth about truth. The biblical argument, and although you're not going to use this, but, but as Christians, we know that God sees truth as important when he... Even in the Ten Commandments, he says, do not bear false witness. In other words, do not lie. He says this because he believes truth exists and the intentional misrepresentation of, of it is wrong. I mean, it's a commandment. Don't lie. Don't bear false witness, right? Truth is used in everyday conversation. People cannot have a reasonable conversation if what they... What they say and what's being said doesn't comport with truth. It's impossible to have a real conversation. During this election cycle, how many times have we heard the phrase fact-checking? Right? It's important that we live by the reality that there is truth and truth exists. This is important because when you're building the case for God and the case for faith and the case for Christ and the case for salvation, you have to let them know there is such thing as truth. And it's actually, you can actually know something is true. Because this is another thing that I say, well, that's your truth and that's my truth. No, there is truth or there is false. That's all there is, falsehood or truth. Now, you, it, could be, it could be true that what I believe is not true. It's false and what you believe is true. But we were trying to get to the, 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 the bottom line is there is truth and we're trying to discover truth. Not there's all kinds of truths that are in contradiction, right? Truth is utilized in court cases, right? People take oaths to tell the truth in a, in a court of law. Not their truth. Well, my truth is judge, and they begin to tell, right? The phrase, what's the phrase, guys? The truth, the whole truth. Exactly. This means telling it like it is. That's what you're saying to somebody in a court of law. You're saying tell it like it is. Not like you want it to be. Not like you're trying to dissuade somebody. Truth is essential to everyday life. It is mandated by the legal system. The correspondence view of truth is the true view of truth. That truth is real. It's, 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 it's as real as anything out, out there. And truth can be known. Here's the question, though. Can someone actually know the truth? And the answer is yes. But I promise you that even as I asked you that question, there's a lot of us have a little pause, right? You hear, can you, does that person really have the truth? And you're like, well, that's kind of that's saying something. They have the truth. Yes, you can have the truth. Somewhere along the line, we've started to tell people that, well, maybe it's just your truth. No, it is the truth. You can know the truth. It's possible to know the truth. So answering opponents to the truth and there are oppositions to it, we're going to look at the following. We're going to look at these types of thinking that oppose truth. The first is relativism. This denies absolute truth. The second is agnosticism. This denies knowing, we're going to break these down in a minute, knowing any truth. Skepticism doubts all truth. And then we have what's called postmodernism, which affirms no truth. 
So let's look at each one of them and kind of look at some arguments against them. The first is agnosticism. So it comes from two, two uh, root words. Ag, or a, which means no, and gnosis, which means knowledge, which means I don't have knowledge of something, having no knowledge of something. But, but agnosticism as a belief system says truth about reality is unknowable. In other words, you can't really know the truth about reality. There was a ph philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant, very, very well-known philosopher. We don't have enough to go into all of his teachings. But he said we can't know truth about reality. And he was very famous. A lot of people began to follow him. The teachings are pervasive within universities. Agnosticism teaches that we can only know appearance, but not reality. It's the idea, kind of like the Matrix. You remember the movie The Matrix? It's like, how do we know we're, do you know you're really here, <laughs> you know? Or maybe, you know, you're plugged into something, right? No, we can know, we can know things. Agnosticism says we can't know the thing in itself, only the thing to us. So agnosticism says we must remain agnostic about reality. So what are some arguments against agnosticism? Kant claims to know that agnosticism is true because he wrote whole books on it, not just for himself, but as an objective truth, enough to say we should know that it's true. Well, that's self-defeating. To teach a book to say that we can't really know, but I'm telling you that you can't really know, is to tell me that you know that we can't really know. Do you understand how it's self-defeating? No one can truly live out agnosticism in this way. We live believing. Listen, when I get up in the morning, I get up believing that the sun is going to shine and that I'm going to a job that's actually there. I, I wake up believing and putting my trust in the fact that I walk out and there's going to be a car. And at the end of my paycheck, I'm going to get, at the end of the week, I'm going to get paid. I, no one lives their life like this. We, we live our lives with the belief that there is truth and it's knowable, right? And so we go to work trusting that there's a place. You know, Occam's razor is basically saying whatever is the most likely answer is probably the answer, right? Occam's razor suggests it's more likely that this is true. There is truth and it's knowable. No one truly lives by agnosticism because life is too predictable, we plan as if life were reliable. We believe in constancy and order. Agnosticism is unlivable because we constantly act as if we do know reality and we trust in truth. And so it's not a real, a real lived out idea. Agnosticism is self-defeating because those who hold it say that they know that we can't know. Do you understand? Let's move on. Skepticism. Skeptics would say doubt all truth. We should doubt all truth. One of the followers of skepticism was, uh, was David Hume, another philosopher. He argued that we should doubt everything about reality. I don't know where these guys spent all too much time thinking about this stuff. He claimed that we can only know sense data. In other words, information that comes to us through our five senses. That's all we can know. And we should doubt everything else. We, he believed we should suspend judgment on all truth claims about reality. Man. Skepticism is either self-defeating by claiming we should be skeptical about everything, including skepticism, right? Or it begs the question by claiming that doubt is the only thing that should not be doubted. Do you see how it's self-defeating? Hume assumes skepticism is true by presupposing the truth of skepticism. He presupposes the validity of skepticism without allowing skepticism itself to be questioned. You probably heard of Descartes, right? He was another philosopher. A lot of philosophers. Descartes, I love, I love he was a 17th century French thinker. He was known as the, the father of modern philosophy. He said this, the more I doubt, the more certain I am that I am doubting. <laughs> the more certain I am that I am doubting, the more certain I am that I exist. Therefore, doubt leads to certainty. <laughs> yeah, it's actually true. He climbed inside a pot belly stove and tried to doubt himself away. Tried to doubt everything he could possibly doubt, except there he began to think. And he said the phrase that you, a lot of, many of you have heard, I think, therefore I am. You've heard that phrase? That's where it comes from. 
Okay, let's move to postmodernism. Postmodernism, and this is where we live today. Most of our culture is affected by and infected by postmodernism. It affirms no truth. The postmodern movement, driven by philosophers uh, uh, Jean Francois Lyotard and Michael Foucault, Foucault, there's a lot of them, but the challenge the idea of objective truth and grand narratives. It argues that we need to deconstruct or break down and question all truth claims. So it's trying to, if you, if you see it, you'll see it, you see it everywhere, right? It's in our culture. Just try to, try to attack the truth claims, try to break them down. According to postmodernism, we can piece together various views, but even after doing so, no view is objectively true. It's just another interpretation, which is exactly what we were talking about, right? So arguments against postmodernism. Postmodernism either claims to be true, which makes it self-defeating, or it claims no truth, which makes it pointless. Because if there's no truth, there's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a pitiless, pointless place to be with, when there's no truth. Regarding reality, meaning, and action, folks, listen, if there's no God, which I'm going to lead to later as we get through this, there is no meaning, there is no value, there is no purpose in life. Think about it. You cannot argue meaning, purpose, or value if we're just random occurrences, randomly bumping together because of the process of unguided electrons and whatever we are, you know, bags of, uh, of cells that happen to be here. Regarding reality, meaning, and action in regards to postmodernism, if postmodernism is true, then there's no stable reality, only disorder. It leaves life without meaning. It leaves life with no purpose. Actions are left to personal belief. For example, if a professor decides to give a student who believes they earn an A, an F, he doesn't need to explain why. He just appeals to his own truth. Think about how this would not work anywhere. Postmodernism ultimately unravels itself. By denying any objective truth, it leaves us with chaos. No real meaning. It makes it impossible to rely on anything concrete for decisions or beliefs. And we can't live. It's unsustainable. But we live in a culture where lots of people are trying to promote it. But we want to talk to them about the truth about truth. That it is real. That it does correspond with reality. And there is a reality. And it is knowable. You can know truth. Isn't that great? Listen, it's okay for you to say, I know this to be true. I am going to cover one more, relativism. Relativism denies absolute truth. Relativism is rooted in ancient Greece and Pythagoras, and it developed later on. You've heard of Frederick Nietzsche in the 19th century. It teaches that truth and morality are subjective, varying from person to person. That's what we talked about earlier, your truth, my truth. It's the, they all kind of blend together after a while, don't they? It's the belief that truth is relative to the individual. Each person or culture has their own standard of truth. Truth morals are subjective and can differ from person to person. What's your truth? This is my truth. That's her truth. There are no objective facts, only personal or cultural perspectives. Listen, I talk to people like this all the time. If you want to read a really good book that kind of counters this, uh, C.S. Lewis's book, you've heard of C.S. Lewis, right? He wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. A lot of people know him for that, but he was a great apologist from Oxford. And he, he wrote a book called Mere Christianity. It's one of the best simple little books on apologetics written years and years and years ago. But he talks about the moral argument. And it comes right out of this, right? And so, you know, if you believe in relativism, if you believe that people can just decide things, it, it, it breaks down everywhere. So relativism is, is self-defeating. If all truth is relative, there's no basis for laws or condemning harmful actions. I mean, think about it. How can you would not be able to universally condemn Hitler? And I talked to a guy at work about this who's a Jew, because my dad's side of the family is Jewish, and we got in a conversation, and he said he doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in absolute truth, he doesn't believe, he says that each culture decides. I said, well, then, then how, can we, how could we try at Nuremberg these people for, if they were just doing what they thought was 
their deal. If culture just decides, then what they did was perfectly fine. And if, if my belief and my relative truth is that it's okay to rape old women, then that should be fine. Or kick babies across the yard, or, 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 or skin alive dogs, or whatever most horrible thing you can possibly think of. If relativism is true, then, then hey, we're just all open to our own opinions and our own ideas, and it doesn't work. It breaks down. You can't, it, it doesn't work. If truth is subjective, how do we explain universal laws like gravity? Gravity is real whether we, there is truth, folks. Gra you know, gravity exists whether you believe in it or not. You know, if no people were here, we would still have gravity. Mathematics, mathematics are being discovered. It's amazing. These are all arguments for God, by the way. But mathematics are not being invented. They're being discovered. The ideas. If everybody stopped existing on the planet Earth, six times six would still be 36. There is this law of mathematics that's out there that just exists. So there's just truths. And it will never, six times six will never be 48 or 52 or 10. Do you understand? Because it's true. It's not subjective. You can't, you'd never be able to do anything if you just were subjective on things like that. It wouldn't work. Math wouldn't work. Gravity would, physics wouldn't work. How about moral standards, which is what we were talking about? Morality. Communication would break down as if no one would ever agree on basic facts. If someone said, it's true for you, but not for me, the follow would be, could be, though, listen to this. Is that true for everyone, or is that just true for you? See how it doesn't hold up? You can't even make the statement. Without common truth, then everyday interactions would become chaotic. How would we ever settle any legal dispute? You wouldn't be able to if it's just relativism. If everyone lived by their own truth. Are you hearing the arguments here? We have to be able to bring them. This argument is one that you have to bring to people. Now, how you do that again, you got to do it not like a shotgun. But you got to ask questions, you know. Do you think that, you could use my illustration, do you think that if I was to stand on my roof and say, I don't believe in gravity, that I could then walk off the roof because my belief would create the truth that I could fly? Super simple. And it's really dumb, right? But you're making a point that belief can't create truth just because we believe it, right? Now, they could argue that your truth is not the truth, and that's reasonable, but then you say, okay, well, I'm glad you at least say that there is such thing as truth, and we're all seeking for it. And so what evidence do you have you're building a case for your belief system regarding God or regarding whatever we're talking about? But we want them to get them to get to the point where they believe that there is truth and the truth about truth. That it, the correspondence theory that truth has to correspond with reality. So what is reality, right? Not your reality or my reality, reality, okay? We would be problematic if I started telling you that round was triangle and triangle was square. And I mean, we have a teacher. We were just talking. Will and I were talking. He's a teacher. You he, he couldn't teach anything if it was just, <laughs> you'd never be able to move forward as a society if we really believe this. And so that's the first point that you got to, and it sounds simple, but that's what you're building the case on. Classical apologetics is talking about the truth about truth. Is it real? Getting them grounded on the fact that there is truth. And we're all searching for it. So can we agree on that? Yes, we can agree that there's truth. Okay. It's not probably going to be a ginormous leap for people if you can kind of just talk them through it, but you want to build a case for the fact that not believing in truth is not sustainable. And, and just no one lives that way. So then we move on to the next step in this, and that is does truth change? Does truth change? And the answer is what? No. It's the same for all time. In all cultures and in all places. Some might say that truth changes, but here's the thing what they're saying. Beliefs may change, but truth doesn't change. Years ago, people used to believe that the people uh, were, lots of people were witches, and they were dunking them in Salem, Massachusetts. Now, that's a whole other argument. Maybe some of them were. I don't know. But the point is, 
if later on we discovered that they weren't witches, the truth hasn't changed. Our belief has changed, right? Because they either were witches or they weren't witches. They didn't then become witches or not become witches based on the argument, but the belief system changes, right? In, in other words, if somebody says um, that they're hot, right, and somebody else says they're cold, right, then then no matter where they are in the world, that person is still hot, that person is still cold if we're talking about them. If I'm hot here in this state and Rhonda's cold because she gets cold all the time, then if somebody, if I told somebody that in Alaska, that truth that I'm hot and Rhonda's cold is still true even in Alaska because it corresponds to the reality that I am hot and she's cold. Does that make sense? So in all places, at all times, in all cultures, truth never changes. And so, for example, people once believed the earth was flat. But the truth is, it was never flat. People just believed that it was flat. So the belief changed. There's lots of things that we're learning. I get that. And we grow in, but the truth never changes. And so that's a real simple way to kind of get there. It's logical. Talk people through that, right? It hasn't changed. If Jesus was God, he is God today. <laughs> And he'll always will be God. It won't change because of time. It won't change because of every culture it will be true. And every generation it will be true. So answering some of the objections that would come, I'm just going to, I tried to whittle, whittle them down, and these certainly aren't exhaustive, but I came up with some objections and maybe how we would answer them. So here's an objection. Belief in absolute truth is a narrow view. People might say that. That's very narrow of you. You Christians are so narrow-minded, Right? Here's the response. You ready? Truth is, by its very nature, narrow. It is. Four plus four is eight, and it's not ten. It's not a million. It's not. It's so narrow out of the entire number, the, the infinite amount of numbers that we could come up with, it's only eight. That's how narrow it is. So you just agree with them. Yes, it is very narrow. And I'm narrow-minded to believe it, and so is everyone when they make a truth claim that's true. It's narrow, right? The funny thing is, they're just as narrow with whatever truth claim they're making because they're claiming it to be true. But we want to decide, does it correspond with reality, right? Are you with me? You guys getting this? Okay, it's important. We're building a case. Objection number two, no one can have an absolute understanding of truth. Listen, truth can be absolute without us having an absolute understanding of it. For example, viruses and bacteria were causing illness long before we could see them or knew that they existed, right? Just, when we, just because we didn't know about them didn't mean that they weren't doing things. We were doing all kinds of ideas. We were bloodletting. We, were, we thought that it was we thought it was spirits that were creating sickness. We thought it was bad air. We came up with all kinds of ideas. But that doesn't mean they were true, right? So truth can be absolute without us having an absolute understanding of it. Later on, we got an understanding of it. We have absolute evidence for very few things, if we're honest about it, right? But there are truths about all things. Are you gathering what I'm saying? How about this? Objection number three. There are examples of um, there are examples of relative truths. They say I, I can I can show you there are examples of relative truths. There there are truths that are relative. No, those examples fail every time. Whatever is true is always true for all people, all places, all times. A relative truth would suggest that something is true for some but not for others, which simply is is never the case. You cannot. It's illogical. You cannot show me it. If one man, like I said, going back, and this is where that comes in, if one man feels cold while another feels hot, but it's true everywhere that their experience corresponds to the objects or conditions that are causing them. So what are the conclusions? Beliefs cannot change a fact no matter how sincerely they're held. And so you're trying to persuade people in the argument for truth that truth is knowable and that they're seeking for truth, aren't they? And, and you are too. Ultimately, I want to share with them the truth of, of the God who I met who changed my life and, and how the evidence, there's, 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 there's objective truth that is out there 
pointing to who Jesus was and what happened and, and, and their changed lives and all of the things, right? But they have to believe in truth to get there. Truth is transcultural. Just because someone is raised in a particular culture doesn't make their beliefs true. What about com- countries that have believed in cannibalism? Was that, a, was that a good thing? Was that a was that a noble thing because they believed it and they were raised that way? No. They were living contrary to what God made them to do, right? It's not true that cannibalism is okay for those people because they lived in a culture that way. It's either true or it's it's either good or it's not good. It's either what we God created us for or it's not what he created us for. One's attitude doesn't change truth. People may not like truth, but it remains true. And that's really what it comes down to, isn't it? It's preference. I just don't like what you're telling me. I don't like that. I don't. And, and what's happened is the church has bought into this. And so, you know what we don't do? We don't talk about the blood. We don't talk about the cross. We don't talk about hell. We don't talk about sin. We talk about, hey, your best life now. Because we, we know the truth, but we've bought into a culture who says, ah, I don't like that truth. And so they want to believe another truth. So they try to come up with another idea that sounds more palatable. But just believing it doesn't make it true. Loving relationships do not change the truth. So sexual immorality, dysfunctional families, they remain wrong even if love persists. People are like, well, they just love each other, or they just love me, or uh, they call, we have arguments. Sometimes we argue that it must be true because it feels good. How do we live in a culture where if it feels good, it must be right? Right? No. It's either truly wrong or truly right. We just got to find out which it is. And so sometimes in this stage of the argument of apologetics and the classical argument, you may not even be giving them things to believe. You're just trying to let them understand that belief is possible in truth that is actually real. That's all you're trying to get them to do, to agree that there is truth. Not, not that, they're tr- they're, that, that they believe something that's not true even at this point. And what you have is truth. You're just saying, do you believe in truth? Yes. Get him to that place. Are you getting it? First step. Okay, then we go to the next step, right? And this is a, the very next step, which is important on the 12 steps. The opposite of true is false. Okay, you're like, duh. This argument addresses the issue of what's called pluralism. Do you guys know what pluralism is? Raise your hand if you know what pluralism is, Right? Okay, pluralism is the belief that all faiths lead to God. How many times do we hear this one? It it is a pervasive idea in our culture. I'm going to give you some some quotes. Beyonce, in an interview with Vogue in 2018, said, I believe God is in everything. Whether it's through religion, self-awareness, or something else, we all find our way. Will Smith, in a 2015 interview, said, I believe there are as many ways to connect with God as there are human beings. Oprah Winfrey once said, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe there is only one way. There are many paths to what we call God. Pope Francis, this is a good one, this week. I was like, wow, talk about timely. He said, all religions are paths to reach God. They are like different languages in order to arrive at God. But God is God for everyone. If you start to fight my religion is more important than yours. Mine is truer than yours. There, there will, um, where will that lead us? This reflects his view that different faiths are valid paths to the same divine destination. I'm going to tell you emphatically that's false. Pluralism is false. But I'm going to give you arguments for how it's actually illogical. When someone says, look, I, look, I go to rooms all the time as a chaplain, and I, I don't know how many times I've gone to a room and someone says that they're a faith different than mine. I have people say, well, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist. And I say, okay, well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Jesus follower. And just having a conversation. And they go, yeah, well, that's okay. You can pray for me because I, all, the, all the faiths lead to the same God. That's exactly what they say. It happens all the time. It's the exact same thing here. Now, I don't immediately jump out and say, that's absolutely wrong. <laughs> I pray to my Jesus <laughs> with them, you know, 
And my goal is that he will reveal himself to him, right? Because I'm not there to proselytize. I'm there to comfort somebody in the midst of this. So it's a little different, right? But it is a lie, and it's being told everywhere. People genuinely believe. It's like, it's like a bunch of highways in America that are all leading to Florida. We're just all on different paths going to the same God. No, you're not. You're going to different gods, and it's completely illogical. And I'm going to give you good arguments for it, which is the second point, okay? So earlier I talked about what truth is. It's, the, it's that which corresponds with reality. Let's say it again. Truth is that which corresponds with reality, right? I also mentioned that falsehood is the opposite. It's something that does not correspond with reality. Falsehood doesn't tell it like it is, remember? You're going to keep this in your mind. To claim that the opposite of true is false, we need to look at what's called the laws of logic. And you need to write these down. And this you need to memorize, okay? The second law, especially, but I'd love you to know all three laws. We're going to cover them, okay? The laws of logic are, are laws. Um, you can read it up here. They're laws that govern rational thought and reasoning and define the structure of valid arguments, helping us to distinguish between what is true and what is false. These are actual laws that exist outside of ourselves. These aren't laws that we came up with. The laws of logic just exist, which, by the way, is evidence of God. Because how could you have just laws like the laws of gravity, the laws of logic, the laws of, uh, of mathematics, unless, the laws of morality, unless there was a lawgiver, right? Which is a great argument later on. But I'm just telling you that there are called the laws indisputable. All philosophers everywhere will tell you these laws exist, okay? So I want you to memorize them. I want you to write them down. The first is called the law of identity. And this is what it says. Something is what it is. A is A. That's an actual law. You're like, is this a real thing? It is. The law of identity. A is A. Table. <laughs> Paper. Man, right? This is the law of identity. And it has to be grounded in truth. If I say penguin, no, this is not true, right? The law of identity is something is what it is. That is true. It is what it is. It's like your mama used to say, right? It is, or somebody, I don't know who said that. It is what it is, right? So that's the first in the laws of logic. The second one is the one you absolutely need to memorize. It's called the law of non-contradiction. And I use it probably more than any argument with people. Something cannot be both true and false at the same time. A cannot be A and not A. Okay, let me give an example. She's either pregnant or she's not pregnant. That's it. She can't be kind of pregnant. She either, it's either raining or it's not raining, right? It's either dark or it's light. People say, well, it's dusk. No, dark or light. Dusk is a complete, dusk is real, but it's a different thing, right? So you, you, can, you can apply it. Give me another example, guys. Either something is what or what? Give me one. Funny or not funny. Man or woman, right? So this is the law of non-contradiction. We're going to come back to it. I want you to memorize it. Next is the law of the excluded middle. A statement is either true or false. There's no middle ground. It's either A or not A. That's it. It's not kind of A. It's either A or not A. If you did find something, like either the car is not painted or painted, and someone said, well, no, it's partially painted. Well, that's completely different. That's still a truth. It's just it's a partially painted car. But that's not a that's not a kind of painted or kind of not painted. That's, did you get what I'm saying? It's another category. But it's either A or not A. That's it. That's your only options. So the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle. Memorize these. I mean, go with flashcards. Write laws of logic on one side. Write these on the other side. Memorize them till you can say them in your sleep because I promise you'll use them. The law of non-contradiction is undeniable. It cannot be denied without being affirmed. You can't say it's false and not true at the same time. 
you can't say, I don't believe in the law, <laughs> the law of non-contradiction. You're like, well, you're contradicting yourself. A famous philosopher, I love this. <laughs> I don't know why I put this in there, because some, I saw, uh, some, I saw um, Norman Geisler said this in one of his talks. Avicenna said this, anyone who denies the law of non-contradiction should be beaten and burned until he admits that to be beaten is not the same as to be not beaten, and to be burned is not the same as to not be burned. <laughs> Maybe a little strong, but he's making a point, because it's illogical. Does anyone have examples of how this applies to maybe in evangelism? Can you think of? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you there, but if you know how it would apply ahead of time. All right. Let me give you an example. What's a self-defeating statement? You know, the, I love how um, Frank Turek calls it the roadrunner effect. I love that. You remember the roadrunner? So the roadrunner was being chased by the coyote, and he would run all the way to the edge of the cliff, and he would freeze, right? He usually... He would stop, ding, and then the coyote was going so fast, he would go out, out over the cliff, and he would hold up a weird sign like, yikes, and then he would, what? He'd plummet, right? Because he was standing on nothing. He had nothing to support what he's saying. That's called the roadrunner effect. When people say things that don't hold their own merit, in other words, they make statements that, don't, that contradict themselves, that don't even stand up to their own statement, that's the roadrunner effect. It cannot be, so let me give it, let me try to think of an example. It's a self-defeating statement. Here's some. If someone says, there's no absolute truth. Right, exactly. Is that statement absolutely true? See how it doesn't, it's, it's self-defeating. It doesn't hold its own standard. If someone says all truth is relative, is that truth also relative? If all truth is relative, even that statement is Right, it's not reliable, right? It's relative. How about this one? I love this one in our culture. You shouldn't judge people's beliefs. Is that a judgment that you're making about not judging beliefs? Right, isn't it? It breaks down, doesn't it? It's impossible. Um, it's wrong to impose your beliefs on others. Aren't you imposing your beliefs that I shouldn't impose my belief on others? That's what's happening. Do you understand? No one can know the truth. Do you know if that's true, right? So I love this quote. I don't even know who, 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 who came up with it. But he who breaks logic will in the end be broken by logic. I like that. It's a good one. Maybe we'll figure it out. People often say that all religions, and this is where you're going to apply this. This is where we're going to use it. People will say all religions have part of the truth. This is that whole thing. Do you remember that? You guys ever see the picture of the elephant and and, and there it is, and a bunch of blind men touching it. Have you ever heard this illustration before? So if you took a bunch of people who are blind, this is what they'll say. People will argue. People who, are, who believe in pluralism will say, well, one man is touching the tail, and he thinks that it's, it's um, a snake. And the other one is touching the ear, and he believes it's a fan. And so that's his. Another guy's touching the, tr the leg, and he feels that it's a, a, a tree. You know, and so that, that's that's how the world is. All the religions out there, they're all touching the same God. They just have their part of it. Well, what what's the problem with this analogy? In this analogy, several blind people touch a different part of an elephant and they think they know the whole truth based on their experience. The problem with this analogy is that it assumes there is an ultimate truth, that there is an elephant, which the blind men are missing. So actually, <laughs> this actually, that illustration actually shows that there is one truth, and these people are all missing it. It breaks down. Do you understand? Because he is an elephant. He's not a tree. He's not a this. He's not. So it's actually upside down. It doesn't pr prove pluralism. Instead, it teaches that only one perspective can be true, which is the point we're making. So pluralism is wrong because opposite religions uh, opposite religious beliefs cannot all be true. So I'm gonna, this is where you got to use this for people. You're going to use this argument. Remember the law of non-contradiction? This is how you're going to use it. Christianity says, this is what I'll say to people. You can come up with your own, but here's a few of them. I'll say, did you, did you know that, I, I start out by saying, did you know that all of the religions in the world, take all the major religions, Hinduism, um, Buddhism, 
Christianity, Islam, Judaism, those are your majors. There's a lot of minors, but the major ones. Do you know that they agree on only superficial things? That most of their belief systems are actually in, in contradiction. For example, Christianity says there is one God. Buddhism says there's 30 million gods. Okay, let me stop for a minute. If all paths lead to the same God, and they believe that there's 30 million, and you believe there's one, these, con these are contradictory statements. They can't both be true. There's either 30 million or there's one. At this point, I'm not telling you that the 30 million is true. I'm just telling you that they can't both be true because they say contradictory things. And the law of non-contradiction, have you ever heard of it before? And you can explain it, right? Here's another one. Christianity says Jesus is God. We say he is God. Judaism says what? He is a man. Islam says he is a prophet. Three different views. They can't all be true. I'm not even telling you which one is true. I'm just saying your idea that all these faiths are leading to the same place cannot be true because they're saying contradictory things. Is this making sense? Christianity says Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. Judaism says he died on a cross and he stayed dead. Islam says he never died on a cross. So they can't be true because they're saying contradictory things. The law of non-contradiction says this can't be true. Right? Why? What does the law of non-contradiction say? Read it to me. Somebody has it. Huh? Huh? Right. And these are contradictory statements. Do you see how this is simple, but we often just don't. A lot of times we hear people say this and we don't even have a rebuttal for it. Now you have a rebuttal. But you have to learn some of these differences. Christianity says salvation comes through faith in God by grace, not by works. 100%. Grace and faith. No works. Nobody could work their way. Islam says it's, to, it's through your works. It's how good you are at the end of your life. Christianity, this is, this is a sidebar, but Christianity, you know, could you imagine, I heard, a, I think Ravi Zacharias said this, I like it. No, it was another, anyway, it was an apologist uh, in a conference that I heard. He said this. He said, could you imagine if a, a guy was wanting to, to marry a, a girl, and he said to her, well, you need to come by and you need to cook really well for me. And then um, you need to clean really well. And you, need to, and you need to iron my clothes really well. And you need to do a good job at taking care of the house. And you, do, you give him all this list of things. And then at the, end of, at the end of all that, I'll decide whether you're going to be my wife or not. Right? But you have another belief system that says, hey, you'll be my wife. And then later on, I'll find out if you can <laughs> do some of these things. Right? That's the difference between Islam and Christianity. Islam says, do good works, good works, good works, good works. At the end of your life, if you've done enough, you'll make it in. Christianity says, no, you can make it in because Jesus did the work, and you're going to blow it, and you're not going to be good at it, but he accepts you even with all of the issues that you have. Do you see the difference? Christianity teaches heaven and hell. When one dies, they will go to either one or the other. Buddhism says there's something called reincarnation. You're living this thing over and over and over again till you reach what's called nirvana, perfect nothingness. These can't both be true. You either go to heaven or hell, or you reincarnate over and over and over to nothingness. These, these can't be leading to the same place. Buddhism doesn't even teach there's a God at all. There's not a God in Buddhism. Christianity does. But people will say these things like, well, all faiths are leading to the same place because they've never investigated what those faiths even teach. So all you're going to do is try to give them a couple ideas. And remember, you don't want to blast them. You're just telling them, hey, did you know that, you know, pick, pick a religion. <laughs> Ask them to pick one, you know. Well, what about Mormonism? Well, Mormonism says there's a plurality of gods that goes back into eternity. Do you know that Mormonism teaches that, that, I, that every person who can elevate to godhood and eventually have their own planet? And that there's, there's an infinite amount of gods and that our god was on the planet Colon? I mean, completely different. Christianity teaches there's one god. He says, there's none before me, neither shall there be after me. 
These can't both be true. So that means Mormons can't be, Mormonism cannot be a Christian faith because they're contradictory. Now, I didn't want to step on my own mouth and say that Mormons can't be Christians because I do believe there are some Mormons who accept Jesus as their Savior and don't even know that their church teaches some of those things. But I'm saying those claims contradict one another, okay? Are you with me? These examples show, and I'm going to close with this, how using the law of non-contradiction can help overcome pluralism. All major religions differ greatly on essential theological matters. The question isn't whether they all have some truth, because they do. It's about which one is true. Yeah, every faith out there has some truth in them. They say treat people good, the golden rule. You can find it in all the faiths, right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about major issues of God, salvation, eternity, purpose, meaning, value, right? And so in summary tonight, we've covered some foundational questions about truth. What it is, how it's knowable, whether it's absolute. We've seen that truth is not subjective. It's not relative. It's, not, it's, it's really that which corresponds with reality. We address the objections from relativism, agnosticism, skepticism, postmodernism, all of which fall apart when held up to logical scrutiny. We also looked at pluralism, the idea that all religions lead to God, and saw how the law of non-contradiction shows the opposite beliefs cannot be true. So as we wrap up, I, I want to challenge you to reflect on these this week. Throughout this week, memorize those the laws of logic. Memorize that first open that's first syllogism because it just talks about truth. And how do you live out the truth in your daily life? And how do you handle conversations where truth is being questioned? Memorize these, write them down, commit them to memory. And then next week, I'd like us as we open up to be able to share if we've memorized them, okay? This is a lot, I know, but this is how all the classes are going to kind of be, right? But this is good information. We, we talked about what's something that a lot of people would say, how did you spend a whole hour talking about truth? Well, you, you can see how unpacking it is important, right? And understanding how we're telling people that there is such thing as truth. Everybody's pointing that. If you were not here last week, you can point at that, and it'll give you the notes <laughs> so you can download them, okay? And I do have one copy here for somebody, whoever comes up first and wants my copy, you can have that. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Lord. We thank you, God, that when, when Pilate met with you, he was meeting with truth. We thank you, let God, you all truth comes from you, Lord, and you created all things, Lord. I pray that the things we talked about tonight, God, I know that I can get in the way of, of my own teaching sometimes, but I pray that the, the, the teaching and the evidence and the, the logical way to be able to explain that would land in the hearts of every person here and those who watch this online. And God, help us to formulate good arguments to talk with people to, to show them that there is truth, God, and the opposite of truth is false, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you for the opportunity of meeting today. We commit this to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, guys. Next week is a big one. We're going to talk about is there a God, okay? Evidence for God next week.